Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you and welcome to this edition of My Soko. It's a great pleasure to have you all with us here today, and we appreciate the time to join us in this discussion. I have wonderful panelists with me today. I've got Mehdi Akutu coming in from Accra, and I've got Ademola joining us all the way from Lagos, Nigeria. Thank you very much, and welcome to the April edition of My Soko. Um, maybe just a Thank quick you, lightning introduction. Maybe can you tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're calling in from, and um, how everything is on that side of the continent? Hello, Carol. Good afternoon, and good afternoon to all our guests. I'm based here in Accra, Ghana. Lovely sunny weather. All well this end, and really looking forward to our session this afternoon. Thanks, Mehdi. Demola? Uh, good afternoon, Carol. Good afternoon, Mehdi. Uh, I'm literally next door to Mehdi in Lagos, Nigeria. You know, it's a 20 minute flight. Um, also sunny. Um, welcome to all the guests. Looking forward to a great conversation. Okay, so we'll go straight into it because, you know, normally my SOCO has been focused on speaking to marketing professionals about things marketing. And this month we decided to focus on leadership and one of the challenges obviously it would be remiss of us not to speak about the impact of covid on all of us especially as leaders in organizations whether we are in the field of marketing or sales or or anything that um we have people that are that are looking up to us to provide some level of direction so i'm going to go straight into it and uh Damola, i think the first question is going to go to you Let's talk a little bit about this pandemic crisis. Why are you in a crisis professionally or personally? Did you feel like there was a crisis? That's a very loaded question, uh, Carol. I think it's, it's difficult to give uh, you know, a sum, one, one sentence answer to that question. The way I'd like to approach this is, yes, we did start out. I did start out feeling like I was in a crisis like the rest of the world. Um, maybe it's a little bit of, you know, the kind of industry I'm in could be my great team that I really, really love working with, but it seemed to taper off really nicely. We got to grips with what was going on, what we needed to do, and then began to just tick off those things. In retrospect, and this is where, you know, it's a little bit difficult to say. In retrospect, when I look at the results that were delivered in 2020, um, you you wouldn't know that we were in a crisis. That's I think the the difficulty in that. Yeah, but well, on all the fronts, uh, personally with the children, uh, working from home, schooling from home, definitely there was a crisis. Okay, but that's fantastic. It means that professionally you were thriving, yeah. and you know the results show for that. And maybe yes, I'll, I'll I'll just ask a little bit. If you had to say two things that would have been the difference between survival and not survival, what two attributes would you put it down to? I think, first of all, the processes and the systems that we have in place, and then the people. So I think for me, those were the two big things. We, we, we were able to change, you know, evolve very quickly um, and adapt to what was the new reality. And I think the people, they, they, they went to bat for us. They came to the table in different ways and innovation mindset, entrepreneurial thinking. It came down to the people, the quality of the people, I think, is what saw us through this. That's really interesting. Um, Mehdi, Demola raised an interesting point when he was talking about, um, on the personal side, you know, the, the, the homeschooling. Did you have that experience? Well, yes, the personal side was extremely challenging. Um, homeschooling the kids for several months. Uh, you get to learn that teaching is a real skill and uh, teachers have a, a, a great role to play in educating our, our children. In my specific case as well, um, I got a new job during the pandemic. So, you know, professionally, uh, starting a new job, getting to know my colleagues. To date, I've only met about a quarter of my colleagues face to face and the rest I've had to build relationships with virtually. So absolutely new experience on, on all fronts in the last year during the pandemic. 
so that's a really interesting um, experience, you know, because there's this huge amount of disruption that came with people not being in a common social space, and therefore the office dynamics are built up slightly differently. Um, mm. Given that you have had the both experiences, would you say that it is actually possible to actively work remotely, build new relationships, sustain professional relationships, or would it have been far simpler if everybody was back to um, you know, the office and, and very quickly getting to know each other? Well, look, um, part of great leadership is about adapting. And so, you know, I've had to adapt quickly and I have fortunately successfully built those relationships remotely. So is it possible? Yes. Is it ideal? No. I, I, it's much simpler connecting with people. Um, it's little things like not being able to fully read people's body language. So if you're a communicator and you seek feedback other than just being said you know you, you want to sometimes be in a room with people see how they act reacting and you're able to better respond as well so i i definitely prefer face to face but uh we have survived the pandemic <laughs> <laughs> and i'll come back to you on 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 that in terms of you know changing jobs and and finding new opportunities in the pandemic but i want to talk to damola a little bit about that because damola you are managing a team of people that were necessarily required to be in contact out with the trade. H how did you make that switch? Yeah, uh, Carol, that, that, that switch, you know, was a difficult one, to be honest, because in, in, in my industry, we've got, you know, marketing and sales in different ways. And for the trade marketeers, their job requires them to be out there meeting the retailers, talking to the trade members, meeting the consumers when they can. And those are things that you cannot do remotely. You have to be out there. So in the immediate, you know, at the beginning, like I said, it was a bit of a crisis. The first thing was to shut down those operations. Yep. And ask everybody, stay at home don't go out, be safe, which is the right thing to do, you know, from a leadership perspective. We've got to do right by the people. The people are important. So we asked everyone to stay at home. But then as things began uh, to unfold and we started understanding what was going on, what the real precautions could be, we then started working towards how can we get these people back to doing their jobs so that they can mm -hmm. deliver. Because, you know, there's also what the company wants and what the people need. Because, you know, there's something about not being out there to do the work you're being paid to do. that it, it does something to you psychologically as well. So we eventually got to a point where we were able to develop the right tools to the, for these people to then begin to make their calls, sales calls, trade calls virtually. And we're still sort of in that dynamic across multiple markets. So there's the Nigeria space, uh, there's what we we're doing in Ghana, what we we're doing in Cote d'Ivoire, Mali, and all the other markets across West Africa. We began to sort of shadow what the government was saying in terms of where the hotspots were. So we went into coding the different locations. You'd have one that was code red, amber, and green, and all of that evolved. So somewhere that was green today could be amber tomorrow, or read the next day. And then we'd, we would determine what kind of or level of engagement the guys would uh, have with trade. Obviously within some certain parameters around the personal protective equipment that we supply to the team um, and to the trade members as much as possible. So it was a bit of a you know, difficulty. Uh, we, up until I think two weeks ago, we still had some locations that were still on code red and people were working either 100% virtually or not going out at all. So there are two interesting themes that have come through already. Uh, Maydi spoke about one, which is the whole idea about being adaptable as a leader. And I think you're also referencing that is things were changing so quickly. So your ability to change with that was important. So I just want to talk a little bit about that idea of adaptability because Maydi raised it. Maybe if I look at your, you know, um, professional career, you've worked in corporate, um, you've run big organizations, including, you know, manufacturing, marketing, and um, you've worked across multiple markets in the continent. If you had to say the, the, the three or four things that would have helped you thrive, um, having had that 
experience, what, what, what specific traits apart from adaptability would, would come to mind? I'm not sure. I think uh, maybe is on mute there a little bit. Maybe I'll, I'll pose that question to Damula as well. Um, Carol, if, let me see. If I understand you, your question is um, to be able to thrive or survive in this crisis, what are the three leadership traits that I think helped me or will help me? Yeah, I think the ones that helped you, because even if I look at your career trajectory, you've worked across multiple markets, which means, mm -hmm. you know, uh, different skill sets, managing people in different environments. Because I think, you know, every environment calls for different um, different skills that come to the front. So for you yes. specifically, wh what do you think w would have prepared you to be able to just quickly get into it, switch, adopt, you know, manage your people and still thrive? And, and deliver. Yes, I, I think the first one that I would like to, to speak to would be um, empathy and compassion, I think are extremely important leadership traits or leadership skill sets, which you know I've, yeah. I've learned to build over the period across my career, multiple locations, different jobs. It's about the people, really. It's about the people. Um, the, the word, I'm one of those firm believers in the servant leadership uh, mode of leading, as it were, Say more. I, I believe Say more. strongly in that. Yep. Um, so uh, it, you, you cannot call yourself a leader if there's no one following you. All right. So the people become extremely important. And it's about how you come across to them. I learned something really early on in my career that you cannot ask people for a hand if they don't have, if you don't have their heart or you've not asked them for their heart. So their heart has got to be in it. And the only way to get people's heart is, you know, a often bastardized word, which is love. But I like to call that in the professional sense, empathy and compassion. You What's see, wrong with love, Damola? Is... Say again? <laughs> What's wrong with calling it love? Well, it could be misconstrued, couldn't it? <laughs> you, you need to be careful how you bandy that word. But I think empathy and compassion, I think, is, is one of the most important things uh, that, I've, that I've learned that has helped me. I think the second one is what we've talked about, um, adaptability. Some call it evolving. I like to call it agility. It's about how quickly we're able to pivot. So to the example I gave earlier, we would never in 2019 have mm -hmm. thought that we would ever pick up a phone or a team's call to make a sales call. It, 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 in your wildest dreams, you would not have thought of that. But that was our reality in 2020. We needed right. to pivot really quickly. And so I think agility will be the second uh, most important skill. Perhaps the third one um, will be decisiveness, uh, Carol needing to take the decisions at the right time. Um, in a crisis, the kind of crisis we had in 2020, a delayed decision is a bad decision, you see, because it's between how you win and whether you're going to lose, you see. So for me, I think those three would be the ones I'll put on the table and say very quickly, empathy and compassion together as the first one, uh, agility, how quickly we can pivot and move on to new things, and then decisiveness, making the right call. Um, oftentimes in, 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 in the COVID uh, pandemic era, you wouldn't know everything. So for me, again, just, just to put that out there, I learned very strongly how to make decisions with 70% of information, where normally you'd have waited for 100%, you see. So decisiveness, I think, was the third one. Okay, that's awesome. Mehdi, Mehdi are you back with us? Awesome. So we're just talking about, you know, the, the, the three things that you brought with you and were able to help you thrive through this um, situation that was completely unexpected. What would your three be? I think we're having some uh, slight challenges there with the internet connection on this. So I think, you know, even as Mehdi comes back on, the question is still has. But Devola, you raise an interesting point around, you know, if you only have 70% of the information, you still need to make a decision. As a leader, how does that decision-making process look like when 
you're in a crisis situation, you know, when there's a fear that you might make the wrong decision and therefore the repercussions of those are far greater. How, how do you balance that? Th those scenarios, uh, Carol, they're, they're difficult to anticipate. Yeah. But again, it comes down to the kind of conversations we have and what that 70% information is based on. Yep. It's ob obvious that you need to base it on some deep insights of the market, what's going on with the market. You need to be very clear on the direction you're going in terms of the goal and what kind of impact this decision, wrong or right, could have. Um, and then you, you just commit. You commit. The 30% might not be because you don't have information. It might be a doubt of whether or not this will work. Would this be the right sort of decision? And you know, one of um, the people I follow uh, often is uh, Jeff Bezos, and he talks about this, you know, disagree but commit uh, mentality where, you know, sometimes we, we don't we don't agree with the decision, yeah. but it, it's the decision. So we commit and we go ahead. And I think that's really what it is. You probably won't know until you come out on the other side of that decision, whether it was the right decision or the wrong decision. Right. But do you have... Um... Do you have a sense that, you know, in a situation like this, where there are so many different stakeholders involved through the process, um, how do you take, you know, that sort of position to say, okay, ultimately that decision belongs to me and I have accountability for it and, and, and run with it? I'm not sure I follow. Could, could you repeat the question? So I said in a situation where you have several people that are required in that decision making process, you know, how do you ensure that we, we quickly as a leader, you can get to the point where a decision is now made and, and let's proceed, you know, let's disagree, but commit. Uh, OK, for, for me, it's really simple. I, I own the decision. That, that's the best way to, to put it. So it's about you taking ownership of the decision. The box stops with you as the leader. Yeah. And so if. If the decision is right, you will take the glory with your team. If the decision is wrong, then you learn. I think what, what I would maybe like to offer as a thought in, in this regard is it's okay for you to make a mistake. It's okay right. for you to, to fail, uh, provided you're learning from that experience. Okay. Uh -huh. So if, if I made the decision, 70% of the information was available, um, and it uh -huh. turned out to be the weaker 70% or the wrong 70%, and coming out at the other side of that decision, I find that it was the wrong decision. Then I raise up my hand. Guys, we got it wrong. What did we do wrong? So we do a post-mortem at that point then, learn from it, and then move on. I think that's the only way. I, I just need to own it as a leader. I made the call, and then we got it wrong. That's what I would do. And I, I think that's an interesting view because one of the challenges we had, especially... Um, you know, as we very quickly entered into uh, the pandemic, there were so many questions around what's happening in marketing. And, you know, decisions were made that says, okay, let's stop all spend. And there was, you know, absolutely no way to be able to uh, justify or commit one way or the other. And I think somewhere along the line, um, in this sort of decision-making processes where it's a unilateral decision, doesn't it, bring about a, a culture where people would be like, well, rather not take a risk and, and say the wrong thing and, and just go ahead with it, even if it's not a decision that I think or agree with necessarily? I, I would hesitate to, you know, characterize it as making it a culture. I think based on what was going on at the time, um, to use your example, stop all spend was the right kind of decision to make. Um, I made the same decision. I said, guys, we, we we cannot talk to the trade. Obviously, we can't talk to the consumer. He's not out there. He's locked up in his home. So you need to stop all activation. Then when we understood better, we started talking about, can we build an activation platform that caters to our current reality as well as what the future could hold? Can we begin to dream again of when we can activate, when we can talk to the consumers? Perhaps we need to move it from offline to fully online. Does the regulation allow us? Do we have the tools for that? Can we get it if we don't? You know, So we begin to have those kind of conversations. 
but it will be an evolution. Um, and maybe if, if you want to characterize it as a culture, it will be the culture of, you know, um, being agile and then being able to evolve as more information becomes available. I think that would Correct. be what I would see as a culture. Correct. And I think that's what it is. You know, the agility must come into play. You can't just freeze and then yeah. do absolutely nothing after freezing. You know, the freezing must be yeah. done um, with the, the, the intention of being able to unfreeze once all information is available to you. Um, I see Mady's back. Yay. Yes. <laughs> You're still on mute, though. Can we unmute Mady, please? Thank uh, you. Technology is really having me for lunch today. It looks like, but you haven't escaped. Your, your three questions are still waiting for you. <laughs> well, I hear you clearly now, so I think awesome. we can. Awesome. So we were chatting around, you know, the idea of, of what you needed to bring to the table as a leader to be able to thrive and even survive through this crisis. So what were your three things? So Ademola had already mentioned one, which is the ability to take decisions with minimal information. So in a, in a crisis, you don't have the luxury of waiting for, you know, all the data and all the analysis. You have to work with what you've got and just move forward. I had a great mentor who said, you know, decision making is like driving a car. If you go down the road and you're in the wrong direction, you make a U-turn, but make a decision. Absolutely crazy. <laughs> The other, the other, the second one for me is being able to be calm and quiet and reflective. Because in a crisis, many people start running around and there's panic and people feel like so long as I'm moving, so long as I'm looking busy, then things are going on. But what I found to be best is to be able to sit down sometimes, to have a quiet moment and to really reflect and think about what is going on and what your solutions are going to be. And that kind of tends to send, at least for me personally, it centers me and gives me the strength to, to continue. Another one is just the ability to be very comfortable with the uncomfortable, okay, with change. And it, during a crisis, there's a lot of change and it's all happening at hyper speed, okay? So you have to have a certain level of comfort in, in that kind of an environment and still be at peace and to be able to think clearly and, and guide the organization or your team through it. So those for me are the, some of the, the key traits for, for strong leadership during a crisis. So come out of the crisis. What, what do you take with you in that list? So everything is going great. We're in, you know, we're in peacetime now. You know, the, the, the business is fantastic. You know, there are no issues. What do we take, given that, you know, there's no fear of flight? Absolutely. So during peace, you know, you now have to get comfortable with the peace. <laughs> because, <laughs> because sometimes you're now, you now enjoying the, the adrenaline rush. And when the adrenaline is no longer there, you can now also start to feel uncomfortable. So realizing that there is a change, uh, making peace with the peace, and then adapting to that because again the the business and your team need a different kind of leadership during the crisis you absolutely have to be in the front i firmly believe that you have to lead from the front during a crisis but once there's peace once there's stability you can allow you you can step back a little bit and let some of your teams you know start to move forward and to drive some of the some of the key projects and an agenda what you continue with is the ability to still find your quiet moment and to still reflect and be zen and say, okay, are we still going in the right direction? Do we need to change? So those reflective moments, I think for me, cut across, but are even more important during a crisis because you can forget about them whilst you're, you're dealing with a crisis. <laughs> that is quite true. The ability to just be comfortable with the uncomfortable and then be uncomfortable with the comfortable. So, so thanks for sharing that, Meiji. So I asked uh, a, a question uh, yesterday, and Damola touched on it as well. Is there a place for love? Is there a place for love, which Damola prefers to call uh, professionally compassion and empathy? Oh, my I'm, God. I'm just going with plain love. You, you, you need that. You need a lot of that, especially during a crisis, and especially during, during the pandemic we've all been through. For the simple reason, even during peace time, you know, 
I, I say everybody is coming from their homes with different issues. And then we all come into the office and we have to work together to, to drive the business. But during a crisis, during a pandemic, those issues escalate. And you absolutely have no idea what somebody has had to deal with at home before coming into the office. You know, they may be in the office working with you, but their husband may or spouse may be on oxygen in, in, in the hospital. Mm -hmm. And you may not be as good as a leader you may be. You may not be up to date with all the information. So in that moment, you, you, you can be very hard, lose all the love uh, because somebody does something not quite right. And, and you know, you've lost your mojo in that moment. So love is essential, but during a crisis, it's even more so because there's so much uncertainty. And uncertainty just raises everybody's blood pressure and, and confidence. So extra love during crisis and a pandemic, definitely. <laughs> awesome. I'm converted. I use the You're word converted. now. converted. No. We'll just call it love. <laughs> <laughs> I'm coming to you in love. <laughs> so I wanted us to just um, switch a little bit and, and talk around maybe the more personal side. And... You know, the question I have is, is the idea of burnout. You know, you, 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 you can't constantly be on, on high adrenaline, you know, for 12 months at some stage, it catches up with you. You know, you, you know you're trying to take the knocks for everybody and trying to prop everybody up. So how do you prop yourself up? Oh, who wants to go first? Shall I or Ademola? Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I think that, that that is a very, very important question. Um, how to stop and take care of oneself. I think first and foremost, it, it comes with a lot of self-knowledge, okay? And, and being paid attention to yourself. And people who are good at that, you, you kind of know when, when you're getting on the edge, okay? And there, there, there are a couple of things that I do personally that, that help a lot. One is, uh, I connect with my mentors. Because sometimes you're, you're, you're thinking about it all by yourself or because you're a leader in, and they say it's lonely at the top. So that level of extra responsibility of, of managing the whole team through the crisis, wondering if you're taking all the right decisions um, and stuff like that. So during such periods, I connect with my mentors to just do a check-in, you know, this was going on. These, these, these are the solutions or the proposals I've put on the table. Is that kind of in the right direction? Am I doing the right thing? Um, and then for me, the second element is really is really connecting with my family. Okay, so so I download. <laughs> <laughs> I have patience, you know, my my father, my siblings, and. And I use my family and I find that just by offloading that that normally does half of it. So a lot of offloading, if you have somebody with a good ear who will, who will listen, other people, you know, some people like the spa, I, I can't handle the spa <laughs> or the salad. <laughs> but, but my father always says, you must always continue to empty the cup. Otherwise the cup gets full and overflows. So on a regular basis, you know, so I'm, I'm trying to exercise. I must put it out there to put pressure on myself. <laughs> it really does. It's 30 minutes or an hour where you can be absorbed in something that is not work related. Okay. So as those who play golf, you know, you're trying to get that ball in a hole and all your focus is on that and, or whether you're running. So for that period of time, you let go and, the body is able to kind of rejuvenate your mind switches off before you come back so those kind of elements really help but in a crisis you can forget and so it's really prepping yourself to say you know whatever works for you have i exercised have i spoken to my mentor have i offloaded on my family but you need to do that regularly absolutely yeah I, those, those I are some really good more. tips Damala? i couldn't agree more uh maybe. i think that th th the the sum of it is there needs to be an outlet. There needs to be some way to detox. There needs to be some way to distress. Um, and it comes back to you knowing yourself as an individual, knowing yourself as a leader. You need to be aware that 
the team itself or whoever it is that you are leading, they they look up to you to create that sense of balance and calm in this crisis. And the truth is you can't give what you don't have. If you are stressed yourself, you will more, more than likely pass on the stress to them, you see. So there needs to be a different way to distress outside of work. Um, I don't think there's anyone who distresses in work. So it could be family, it could be a different uh, activity. What I was able to do was with my family, my wife and children, you know, just rearticulate the sort of, you know, family goals that we wanted and begin to focus on them more during that pandemic. So downtime would be conversations around that checkpoints, where are we on this? How are we getting on on that? You know, and just generally using that space and that mm. environment to sort of detox. In the first months, it was difficult because you were walking in the same space where you were detoxing. Unlike, you know, normal period where you would go to work and then go home, but here you would work at home and then have to detox at home. So it was a little bit difficult, but it was just a, a very deliberate um, attempt or very deliberately going about having those conversations, like Maddie said, with the people that could provide a different perspective for you and get you to look at it differently. And then I also found um, an outlet in having those deliberate conversations with my team members as well. So as many people as I could offer that hand of compassion or love, like you call it, and say, hey, how, how are you coping? Because one thing I became more aware of during this is the mental health is something that perhaps we're not very attuned to, but it's one of those things that take a beating during times of crisis and times of stress. Um, and so I had team members who, during the course of the conversations, you find out that, oh, there's something going on here. Some were more, you know, in tune with their mental self, mental health and others. And when you have that conversation with one person, when you're talking with another person, you begin to see, oh, this could be the issue. And then as an organization, we were able to then raise awareness of that and try to help people. Yeah. So I, I think, yes, yes, Mady. Just on a the, on the, on the point he, he just raised. Um, one thing we have to be careful of as well is that, you know, one solution doesn't necessarily fit everybody. Yep. So... All organizations were so eager to say, oh, you can all go work from home. Oh, flexibility, you can work from home. But guess what? I mean, it was a nightmare for me. I got a seven-year-old and a four-year-old. You know what working at home is like with a four-year-old and a seven-year-old in the house? It's impossible. It's impossible. So although it sounded so perfect, you get to work from home, it actually was not so perfect for certain members of the team. Okay? Yeah. So some of the flexibility in the making is to say okay you know let's not some people may have to come to the office more often than others mm -hmm. simply because of, of of their home situations or what other solves do do they have so i think that's one important thing to learn that sometimes when we come up with these solutions in a crisis just check that you know it, it works for the majority and and it's really meaningful and then on the subject of perspective, when I talk about mentoring, I, I like the phrase you use, that you want a change of perspective. I'll give one example. In 2014, we had the economic crisis in Ghana. And Ghana had a double-digit uh, inflation. And we're all looking at our costs going up and our margins going down. And I had a mentor in uh, Latin America. And I'm lamenting, I'm saying, you know, mentor, the, the inflation is so high. I don't know what to do and, and, and how do I cope? And he said, did you say 50% inflation? <laughs> and I said, no, 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 15, one, five. And he said, oh, really? We had 300 in Argentina. You talking about- <laughs> <laughs> It's like, you don't have any problems. Um, after that conversation, I was like, my problem is small. You know, maybe go, go figure it out. We're not talking about 300%. So it kind of put things in, in a bite-sized thing that I could, I could manage. So that's just an example of changing of perspective by speaking to relevant stakeholders who can support. And I think that is so important because um, it's very easy as a leader to also have this bubble, you know, that we, we surround ourselves with. And in that process, if everybody is like you and everybody is experiencing the same thing as you, and your entire 
you know, universe of your sample are people like you, you completely lose touch with the reality of, you know, what's actually going on outside of you and, and really accepting that, you know, having a mentor is, is that sitting somewhere else with a completely different experience is actually mm -hmm. maybe more useful than, you know, speaking to the CEO next door who's having exactly the same experience as you. And so yeah. therefore that perspective changes. And I just want to touch on, on that issue of mentorship. And it's, it's, I think it's a really powerful tool and I'm not sure that enough leaders, you know, use it as a tool. And, and, and maybe, maybe, maybe you, you want to talk a little bit around that because, you know, you, you spoke around having mentors. What, what motivated you to, to have a mentor and how are you um, finding value in mentorship as a leader? So to be honest, I was first introduced to the concept and my first experience was, was um, in an organization where they formally set up a mentorship scheme. So junior managers were partnered with directors of the organization and uh, initially gave us guidance on, on how to manage those relationships. But I found great value in it because once a certain level of trust is built, I think you can have really deep and, and meaningful discussions. But going on from there, I then personally developed uh, mentorships outside of my immediate work, work environment. So, um, I have personal mentors. Some of them are former bosses. Some of them are just people I've come across, I think, have value to add. But critically, um, I pick specific topics. If I, if I have a thought, if, if, if I'm trying to solve something, um, I connect with them, both on work level and then on, on, on my personal career progression and growth. Okay? So I have found that to be useful in terms of when there's a trusting relationship people are willing to share and to guide, but you have to also be open to really discuss what's on your mind, okay? And I found that, so that's what I said. I, I find these people, whether they're set by the organization or whether I develop them myself, and it's not that we meet every month necessarily. Some I have done every month, but some may be quarterly or twice a year. It's just when I need to discuss an issue or need to think through, I think, hmm, who might I have that conversation with? And, and it's been really, really helpful. So I remember back in 2009, for example, I had a discussion with, a, with one mentor and I was like, ooh, you know, where do I go with my career now? And he just said to me, Mady, how old are you? Okay, forget running around and chasing money. Go and get a director role. Get a director <laughs> role. Don't, don't take another job because of money. Get the, get the title. It's time to get the title because you have, there's a certain uh, age range when the title is good for you. It's a simple little comment. It's, it's a 10-minute conversation, but it plants a seed. And so the next roles that I looked at, I made sure they were director roles, and I finally got one. And I've had these different experiences. So sometimes I've, I've been in a case recently for example somebody says oh mentor me and coach me and i said okay so what do you want to discuss and they said you just tell me what you want to tell me <laughs> <laughs> no <laughs> no you must have an objective you must have some questions that you want answers to and when you pose those questions you will get some guidance that's awesome Damola, do you have a similar experience Yes, I think, first of all, um, I think the first comment that, that I'd like to make about this concept of mentorship is that there's sometimes, so oftentimes there's a confusion between mentorship, coaching, and sponsorship, particularly within a, an organization. Mentorship or sponsorship, coaching, whichever one, one thing that the three of them have in common, which I think is the most important thing, which maybe alluded to, is guidance. It's about guidance. So whether it's in a crisis and I'm having um, a problem or you have an existential crisis or you have something that you need to bounce off someone, you're looking for guidance. And it's got to be deliberate. So I am quite deliberate about my mentoring relationships. I have several but it's got to be always someone that you feel you can learn from and that can learn from you as well, I imagine. Uh, 
Uh, that's at least that's my perspective on mentoring. It's got to be a two way. If mentoring or any of this development relationships is one way, it tends to fizzle out really quickly. It tends to be one thing that you know will not stand the test of time. So my experience of mentoring or mentorship is one where you definitely have got to build the trust. It has to be someone that you feel my business is not going to go out there. Um, you're obviously not a shrink. You're, it's not psychotherapy or anything, but it, it gets into that space sometimes, particularly when the conversation is really thorny and the person is asking you questions that cause you to think and rethink, uh, sometimes unlearn what it is that you've learned and change your perspective. So yes, mentoring, I think it's, it's a big uh, part of leadership, either to get the mentoring or to be a mentor to other people. That, that's been my experience of it. It's something that I really cherish. I'm very deliberate about them. I find that I need mentors in multiple facets of my life. So there obviously would be some people that you look to for the family uh, or fatherhood development. There'll be others that you look to for the professional uh, development mm -hmm. as well. And I think that talks to a, another very interesting trait or important trait as leaders, and, and that's humility. You know, um, the humility to know that you need help and the humility to accept it when it comes. And, and how do you do you see how do you develop humility? Because I don't think humility comes. In fact, it's counterintuitive from a leadership perspective. You probably got there out of lack of humility, to be honest. And now we're asking you, OK, now, you know, there's a level of humility that comes with 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 your responsibilities to be able to even take you to the next level. Do, do you think that's a natural um, trait that we have as leaders? Is it counterintuitive? Is it something we have to develop? And, and how does it play? I don't think humility is natural to everyone, uh, Carol. Uh, some of us, the same way some people are introverts, some people are extroverts. Some will be naturally more uh, flamboyant, is a positive way to put it. Um, you could call them arrogant. Others would be maybe a little bit more humble. But it definitely works um, as a leader if you recognize the fact that you don't know it all. Yes, the box stops at your table, but you are not always the smartest person in the room. And your role as a leader, a responsible leader, an authentic leader, is one that then understands that you need to surround yourself with people, oftentimes that are smarter than you, and that you can then go on together to achieve that goal. So humility, I think, is definitely something that every leader should have at one point or the other in their life. If you don't, you begin to go after it because it, it, it helps you. It helps you. You can't not be that guy. And I've and you probably have read multiple uh, case studies. There's one of Bob Nardelli in, a, um, I forget the name of that uh, firm now, you know, where it went south for him eventually. He came from GE, uh, went to, I think it was Home Depot um, eventually. He went south. So humility is definitely one thing that every leader has got to grow if you don't have it. Um, and oftentimes you need to drink huge cups of humility if you're going to lead people. Right. And <laughs> Even if you don't have it. <laughs> and maybe, you know, we were having a discussion earlier on around the issue of building teams. And I, I see it's one of, you know, Damola's, I think, even number one, because he keeps referring to it. H how do you see that play out? You know, your ability to really build strong teams and people that can challenge you as a leader and accept that, you know, you will be challenged um, by those teams, but it will be collectively better for the organization. Oh, I think I think it's absolutely critical. When when I'm in a role, I essentially start working to make me redundant in that in that role. And to make myself redundant, there's got to be somebody in my team who can come and seat. And so I I look for those engagements. I look for so somebody willing to take that leadership role and I and I encourage it and, and really push for it. Because it's it's through that that they're also learning and growing. And you know, when you talk when you're talking about humility research just now, for me, I think that to to a learning spirit. Okay, if if you have a real passion for learning, then you you know that 
there's a lot out there that you don't know. Um, other people have probably experienced something that they could, could share with you that could help you. So have that learning mindset. And it doesn't matter where the learning comes from. It doesn't have to come from seniors. It can come from your peers. It can come from your, from your juniors. And so you have to be open to that. But um, I, I, I train my team to, to be redundant as quickly as possible so that I'm available for the next job. <laughs> <laughs> I, I <laughs> That's a perfect what's in it for you moment, eh? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You know, learn and learn fast and ask all the questions and challenge. So long as you're learning through it, it's not just for the sake of it, but it's a learning experience for the team and they're growing through it. Um, I think it's it's fabulous. I think it's fabulous. That that actually is is a very engaged and motivated team, honestly. Yeah. And and if I, I think I want to bring this back yeah. to I was just going to build on, on that thought from Mady, which I subscribe to wholeheartedly. I think I just found another good friend in this uh, conversation, Mady. It, it is the concept of, you know, as a leader, you're building your team to walk yourself out of a job. You're okay. building your team to the point where they don't need you, where your job is, like you said, under threat. I think that's the most important um, thought or most important attribute of a leader is a leader that builds other leaders. And you know, seeing that there's a lot of color in the room, I think that is one big thing that we lack in Africa uh, right now, is uh, <laughs> that, that kind of mindset where it's about what's happening for the next generation, knowing that I, I need these people to then keep my business going, to keep my country going, to remain relevant for the future. It's not always about me. And I think that's really, really important as a leader. It's not about me and the job and the title. It's about who takes over from me. I think if you get it right as a leader, you need to be measured by who took over from you and how well they go. Uh, Demola, you, you, you read my mind and we're going to segue into this um, uh, continental problem because, you know, when I first uh, put out this topic, um, Everybody was like, oh, everybody's talking about leadership and, you know, leading in COVID and leading in the crisis. And my question is, why then does it continue to remain a problem? Why, why, why are we still talking about it if there's a solve already? And really understanding, you know, what, what are the real challenges that we face um, as leaders, either, you know, running organizations, running teams, you know, running units, you know, what, what do you feel from an Africa perspective? What are the real challenges and why does this continue to be an ongoing discussion? You know, everybody kind of can tick the box, but, you know, walking the walk and, uh, and walking the talk seems to be a big disconnect. My friend says the video doesn't match the audio. <laughs> Absolutely. Your friend is wise. Your friend is very wise. Um, I'm not the most qualified person to offer perspectives on governance at a continental and a national level. Um, that is me being humble. But I think that um, the, the, the real crux of the matter is this concept of walking the talk. So several people, so many people understand the concept of leadership, but oftentimes we kind of take it as more from an autocracy point of view, which is my word is law. And that is not leadership. That is not leadership. I remember when once when you and I were talking, I were talking about plurality. There's something about multiple points of view um, and then having a conversation to then agree. Human beings naturally want to be heard. And if I don't feel like I'm being heard, if I feel like you're forcing it down my throat every time, then it's very difficult for me to then follow you because I, what you're saying we should do, I don't think is the way we should do it. And you haven't listened to my point of view. Even if you're not going to do what I want, what I'm suggesting, have a stab at listening to me. And I think that's one thing that we miss here where there are multiple political parties or in some places where there are two political parties where I spend my time in office unraveling what was done by the previous person rather than trying to move the polity forward. Um, I spend my time as the new marketing director trying to say what the last person did was completely wrong rather than building on the successes 
and learning from the failures. And that for me is what it is. It's your friend is really, really very wise. The video doesn't match the audio. They do not walk the talk. And I think that's where we missed it. Look at what happened uh, in, in Africa during the COVID, where there are a couple of countries where people were dying and were saying there was no COVID in those countries. We had states in multiple countries. And for me, it was a failure of leadership. Those are avoidable deaths in Africa and outside Africa as well. You see, um, if you use the US as, as a case study, in the first 100 days, how many millions of people were vaccinated? Whereas in the previous administration, there were many conversations about, oh, it's a hoax, nothing's happening. But it showed that where there's a will as a leader, you will find a way. Interesting. Mehdi, your view on this? I, th I think there's, there's one thing that comes to play um, in, in terms of leadership relationships in Ghana and many parts of Africa, which mm -hmm. is that it's a very directive style. Okay, so from this education system, people start working and, you know, you're told what to do every minute of the day and you just do what you're told and it's kudos to you, okay? So we get into a situation where many people, even as they, 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 they build their careers, they get told what to do, they tell the next person what to do and it's always telling, telling, telling. But you have to understand that if you're the only one coming up with all the solutions, you know, that's when you get things like burnout and or you start getting lots of poor, poor solutions because you can be coming up with all the ideas on the table, okay? So again, to Ademela's point, whether it's about self-preservation, somebody else should try and think about it. If they, if they share with you, it might be 80% there and you, you, you top it up, you make them think about a couple of things and, and then you have a solve. So I have a new recruit started just two, three weeks ago. We had a meeting just recently and she complained about, and she complained about, and she complained about, and there were legitimate points. But I simply said to her, young lady, you are now in the leadership team of your area. You have lost the ability, you have lost the position where you can come and complain and then leave the subject that. As a leader, you complain and then you come up with two or three solutions. And we have to develop people to have that mindset that it's okay to realize what is not going well. But it, you also must come up with a few proposals on the table. And one of them may work or all of them may be viable, but at least it means that you, you've thought about it, you've tried to come up with solutions. And if everybody's thinking about it and we all have a conversation, we might come up with an ideal solution. But as a leader, I, I don't want that headache. I don't know how people do it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have to come up with all the all the solutions, and and when you are in that situation as well, then you are not developing the next the next generation because they don't learn to find solutions. And you know, I do a lot of, and I had that experience, so I give it a lot. A, a team member can come up come up with a problem and 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 a recommendation. The recommendation may not be as good as what I have in my mind. It may have a certain loss of risks, but then I weigh it and I say. Mm, the risks are controllable, they're manageable. Let them go ahead and, and, and implement their idea. It might be only 50 or 60%, but I do the risk benefit analysis. You're like, let them go ahead. They've come up with a, a proposal, let them land it and see how it goes. And it starts to build their confidence in themselves to say, oh, I proposed a solution and, and they did it. it and it is acceptable. But you develop them and you give yourself some time to focus on more important things. Yep. Exactly. And I think we've talked on, you know, at least six really big topical areas with regards to this idea of how we were able to get through this crisis situation, survive, thrive, and now even get to the point where we, we have a responsibility. Um, those of us in leadership position have a responsibility to bring in and, and get the next sort of leaders coming back in to start to change this idea that, you know, and, and I think maybe you're right, that I have arrived. And so I've been eyeing Maddie's seat for so many years. Now she's gone. I'm sitting here. I am now, I, I'm arrived, you know, and, and so everybody must know that I have arrived because mm -hmm. that's how the system has been perpetuated over a long period of time. 
And until we get to that point, you know, we're still going to be talking around how do we develop African leaders? How do we develop people in organizations to be able to take that mantle? And it, it also was a conversation that I was having around, you know, running global organizations where, again, the, 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 there's always a discussion around what, what, what are the opportunities that exist for leaders from the continent um, across the board and how decisions are made um, and whether we have a stake and a play uh, at the table when, when those decisions are being made around, you know, uh, leadership and, and people being seen as getting to the point at the very top of the organization. And what, it, what do you feel is our responsibility um, to be able to get those discussions and, and showcase our people so that they have those same opportunities to be able to get to the next level. So I always think of it as a leadership as actually more of a responsibility than anything else. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, coming to the idea that you were saying it's a master-servant situation, that in fact you, you're there to provide a, a, a huge amount of service with huge amount of responsibility for which you're required to take huge amounts of accountability at the same time. Mm -hmm. So it's not a simple task or a simple job to do. And mm -hmm. I have one last question, you know, before we go in. Um, and, and, and the idea around, you know, we talked about it slightly. H how do we make sure that we continue to develop um, skills and and you know, and, and, and really our ability to lead. How do we ensure that we're getting better and better at it? Because every situation requires a different uh, response. So some organizations offer a lot of training. Um, I've benefited from that enormously. So lots of leadership trainings with, with um, big institutions like INSEAD or Harvard or so there's this, that's one, one um, angle. Another angle for me is books. There is so much information in books. You just got to pick them up and read and you will learn so much. Okay, so pick the next 10 books on leadership that anybody else has written. And I have multiples that I share, I share with teams and, and people. So books for me, one area where when I have something in my mind and Think, oh, I want to learn more about this. I go and look for two, three, four books on the subject and I can read on them. And after I read a few, you start to see some themes coming through. And that starts to tell you that, ah, th these are some of the key pillars that address the area that you're trying to, that you're trying to understand. But again, it goes to that learning mindset. The third, uh, the third element is getting involved in other areas that may not be directly work-related. So I have found being on boards that are not in the same uh, field as I am really insightful. Um, so whether I'm in FMCG manufacturing, obviously, so whether it's on the uh, advisory council for a university or a non-executive on a bank board, you, you just start to learn different things from different um, organizations and different sectors and how different people are handling uh, the same situation sometimes, okay? And you get mm. that exposure as well. So top of mind, those are those are three major learning opportunities that I see. But first of all, you have to have the learning mindset yourself and go and seek that information. That's fantastic. And I've got a couple of questions here, some really good ones. Um, maybe Demola, I'll ask you to take the first one, is how do you motivate a team that is tired? Ooh. There's no silver bullet. I think it's it, it depends on what's going on, why you think they're tired. But you've got to obviously communicate, communicate, communicate. Um, create, like I said earlier, you know, a, a sense of calm and balance for them, and um, rally them around a common goal. If if people have something that they're they're chasing, I think mm -hmm. they will, you know, find that spark. Uh, give them a reason to commit and keep committing mm -hmm. every day um, and try to not to be, you know, wet blanket yourself, which, you know, sometimes can be uh, the position you find yourself as a leader. So it, th there's there's several of those things you could do, but ultimately make sure you are the one that you build up the communication channels, make sure you are speaking to them, avoid Chinese whispers. That's one of the critical things. Yeah. 
Okay, and we have a second question uh, at Meidi, and I think this one is good for you because you, you took on a new role stuck in the between how to work at home and how to work uh, from the office. Um, how do you interact with your teams in this sort of environment? Oh, gosh. Um, video calls are now the norm. I can be on calls from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. So that's, that's part of it. But it's been available. So also lots of phone calls, lots of WhatsApp, just so that your, your team have the sense of you're available to them. I still have my boundaries. You know, I say to them, guys, before you call me after 5 p.m., let's, let's make sure it is really necessary because you had from 9 to 5 <laughs> to, to make that call. So I have my personal boundaries that I still try to, to stick with. But within that, really being, being, being available. And um, yeah, but lots of video calls is, is really what's, what's driving it right now and what's up. And, and how do you make sure you don't tire out? Because a lot of people talked about fatigue. I personally oh. find that at some stage in the day, I'm done. I'm done with video. I'm done with talking. You do. It's, it's, it's excruciating, frankly. Um, the video calls, they, they have a way of draining the energy, the energy out of you. But you, you've got to keep going. But, you know, sometimes there's an option of if it's not critical, you don't put on your video because research shows that when... When you are on video, you're a little bit more conscious and, you know, you're watching your behaviors. Yeah. And so that also saps a, a whole lot of energy. And that's yeah. why sometimes you can do the WhatsApp calls instead of a, a full video call. Mm -hmm. But again, mm -hmm. yeah, so again, it's monitoring yourself. So certain days in a week, I try to keep it to a bare minimum so that it's only for half a day. Um, so I, I manage my calendar. I manage my calendar as much as possible. But there is a lot of, a lot of video calls right now. And uh, one last question is, how do you, wh what do you see as having led to your success um, and how does leadership come into play, um, you know, in your own individual journeys? Um, you know, I I'm just extremely um, result oriented. And, and so when, when I set, a vision, a goal, a, a task. I, I, I go for it. So even, even in the workspace, it's not necessarily the KPIs that have been set for me by the business, but I always have a goal. And I'm always working towards a goal. Both I have goals for my professional life. I have goals for my, my personal life. And, and those drive me. And, you know, every year I'm like, okay, have I, have I achieved this goal? <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> A tick for financial goal, a tick for family goal, a tick for professional goal. So, so that for me, honestly, is is one of the the key elements. I I drive myself hard on on the goals that I set um, by making sure that they're, they're feasible and realistic. And right. keep me going, yeah, and keep focus, Demola. What would you say? I, I couldn't agree more. I, I think the first one is is exactly that. You need to have a plan. Um, which is what media has described as a goal. You, you need to know where you're going and you need to walk at it. You need to give it everything, you know. Mm -hmm. And in that plan or goal, you know, without putting timelines to it, it's difficult to then, you know, push yourself and say, by such and such a time, I've got to achieve this. You've got to be learning. You've got to be developing. Um, I always tell my friends, my team, that the things that you know to do that got you to this level are not the same things that are going to take you to the next level. So you've got to develop yourself. You've got to learn yourself. You've got to grow. Um, you will always be promoted. You will always move to the next level, which would be a level of incompetence for you. So what are you taking to that level? How are you developing yourself today to get to that level? I think for me, those three um, things are sort of what has guided me over the last couple of years. Always have a plan and walk your butt off at that plan. And then always be learning, always be developing. The final one is uh, time and chance. Right place, right time. Yeah, and I, I can't top that. <laughs> I can't top that. You guys have been so fantastic. We're coming up to the hour, and I really, really appreciate your time. I think there have been some really good insights, um, hard work, having goals, having humility, showing up with love, 
um, making quick and, and, and fast decisions, being agile and adaptable. So those, those are some really, really, really exciting um, opportunities for anybody who's looking at a leadership position to say, this is what you need to bring to the party to, to be successful. But ultimately, like Damola says, it's, it's really about being in the right place at the right time. And sometimes like working really hard at it makes you get to the right place at the right time. So Absolutely. thank you, Damola, Mehdi, the generosity of your time, your experience, and just sharing some of these thoughts with us. I think from me, the rest of the team, and everybody that attended us today, we, we are really grateful. And we hope that we will have another session before the year is over, uh, see how we're all doing. Thank Super. you. Thank you for having us. It's been a pleasure. Damola, great being on the panel nice with you. Nice to meet you, too, Be in touch. Fantastic. Yes, and, and please stay in touch. Definitely. <laughs> awesome. Take care. To the Mashoko team, it was <laughs> it was a real great pleasure. Um, check out the platform on Promoflow, mysoko.promoflow.com. Um, all the other recorded sessions will be there. Um, this is an initiative between EXP and Silverstone. And the whole purpose is, again, to bring the big topics to life within the continent. So thank you very much. Cheers. Cheers.